Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, the talk will be in English, so I'll talk English as well. Uh, we're here for a little presentation about uh, unikernel security analysis. Um, Harry here uh, wrote his uh, master thesis about the subject, so he definitely knows what he's talking about. Um, I have no idea what unikernel is, uh, but he promised me that he will start with the basics and then dive deeper uh, in the course of the hour. So I'm hoping to learn something new, which is always good. So uh, thank you everyone and please welcome Harry. <laughs> Yeah, hello everyone, and thank you for being interested in this talk. I see the room is full. This will be mainly about my master thesis at X41 and RWTH Aachen. Who am I? I'm studying electrical engineering and computer engineering at RWTH Aachen, and I'm working at X41 as a working student, mainly doing pen testing and security research. And I'm also a member of Chaos Computer Club Aachen for around four years now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm official member since the G uh, GPN four years ago. <laughs> and so yeah, I'm kind of connected to this event. What is my motivation for a master thesis about Unicorn security? When you open, for example, the Unicraft website, they state that Unicraft is a fast, secure, and open source Unicornal development kit. So. Security is a major claim here, directly behind fast. Nano VMs even goes a step further. They, they say that their unikernels have all the same security protections you would find in a Linux system and more. So they claim to be even more secure than Linux. And my bachelor thesis was uh, also about unikernels. And I realized that there are multiple papers on unikernel performance because everyone who writes a unikernel also do, is also doing benchmarks and so on. But there are only very few papers on unikernel security independently and independently analyzing the security claims made by the unikernel teams. And none of those papers existing on the topic analyzes a unikernel written in a memory safe language and none of them provides an overview of the security features of the most popular, popular unikernels. So this is what I contribute with my thesis. Um, what will I talk about today? First, I will give an introduction into unikernels. Then I will give an introduction into operating system security. I guess most of you already know about the security things, but I also want the people being able to follow the talk who didn't write an exploit yet. Afterwards, I will present my results of analyzing Rusty Hermit, which is a unikernel developed at my university. And this was the main part of my thesis. Then I will go into the analysis of other popular unikernel systems, discuss my findings, and will draw a conclusion. So let's start with an introduction to unicorns. Many virtual machines are only used for a single purpose. So um, often there's a VM spinned up for a web server or another uh, virtual machine, which, which is uh, just a database server. So we have a lot of overhead and we have a lot of stuff in VMs we don't need to fulfill the, p the purpose the VM was created for. And also cloud computing is an emerging field for years now, so we definitely need efficient and scalable systems to quickly spin up new systems if more users want to access a resource and so on. So what are unikernels and how can they solve this problem? Unikernels are based on a so-called library operating system and an application and both is compiled together in one single purpose and single address space image. So we always create one unikernel for one purpose, which allows us together with a library operating system approach to only have this code in our unikernel, which we really need for our task. And because we have a single address space, we do not have uh, context switches, we don't, do not have system calls. System calls became, uh, become just function calls, which makes it also much more efficient. Here's an example from a Mirage OS paper. As you can see, 
in a normal VM, you have the high power, you have the hardware, the hypervisor, and then the operating systems kernel and a lot of stuff in between. And the here the Mirage OS compiler puts everything together and compiles it into a specialized unikernel image. So we can get rid of a lot of stuff um, which is in between. And this also allows us to compile everything together and so also to optimize everything at compile time, which makes it even more efficient. So what are the security claims made by unikernels? The main claim is the reduced attack surface because of the li library operating system approach and the very minimalistic operating system. So code which is not there cannot be exploited. This is uh, one of the main ideas behind unikernel security. And the second claim is that we have increased security because of the strong isolation. If we have one application and one unikernel for one purpose, and they all run on top of a hypervisor, they are isolated from each other by the hypervisor. So now that we understood what unikernels are, we will go into Rusty Hermit. This is a research unikernel developed at my university and it targets high performance computing and cloud environments and is written from, scra from scratch in Rust. And it allows applications to be written in Rust, C, C++ or Fortran. This is not used in production. This is still under development and yeah, for research purposes. So let's go more into the security topic. I will now give an introduction into operating system security. As I already said, for people who already wrote memory corruption vulnerability exploits, this will be not that interesting, I guess, but I want uh, everyone to be able to follow the talk. So operating system security. It is relevant to understand the difference between security in terms of something does not have any vulnerabilities and my operating system provides security features in order to protect the application which runs on top of my operating system. Because our operating system is a service provider providing access to hardware resources, scheduling and so on. But security is also a service. Our operating system cannot stop an application from having bugs, but it can make exploiting those bugs harder by providing security <laughs> features. As you can see in this slide from a Microsoft presentation, around 70% of the CVEs fixed in Microsoft products between 2006 and 2018 are memory safety issues. This is why we'll now concentrate on memory corruption vulnerabilities. Of course, there are other classes of bugs, but we'll concentrate on this. I will now explain one of the most prominent um, memory corruption vulnerabilities. I will explain stack buffer overflows and how an attacker can exploit this. When a function A calls a function B, then a stack frame is built up for that function. It is used to pass the function parameters which are stored on the stack. The problem is when our function B finishes execution, it, the program flow has to go back to function A to continue directly after the function call to function B. This is done by storing this return address when doing the function call also on the stack. What is also stored on the stack are local variables. Here, for example, a buffer with eight bytes. And the next the next code line here reads content into that buffer, but this is where our vulnerability is because we don't do any length check here. So an attacker can just write more than eight bytes. What happens then on the stack is that we reserved eight bytes in this buffer, but an attacker writing more than eight bytes can now write the things that are stored on the stack behind this buffer. An attacker can, for example, overwrite some local variables, but an attacker can also use this to overwrite the return address with an address of their choice. So when an attacker now is doing this, 
then after finishing function b, the program flow does not go back to where it came from, but it goes to the address the attacker wrote into the return address field on the stack. What an attacker can now also do is write exploit code into that buffer and then write the address here and let it point to the buffer so that after finishing function b, the program flow jumps to the code written there by the attacker and so an attacker can take control of what is executed. And of course, there are also much, much more elaborate techniques, for example, return-oriented pro return programming and so on, but we'll concentrate on this basic mechanisms here. So we have requirements for a successful attack. The first one is that an attacker can write and execute exploit code. The second one is that the attacker knows the target address where to jump to. And the third one is that we have no integrity checks on the stack because if the application would be able to detect that it was exploited, then it could just uh, stop execution. And for each of these requirements, there is a security mitigation provided, provided by the operating system in order to hinder an attacker from successfully exploiting a vulnerable application. I will now talk about these security mitigations and give a quick overview if and how they are implemented in Rusty Hermit. So our first requirement was that the attacker can write and execute exploit code. And the mitigation for this is called WX policy. The idea is to make memory segments either writable or executable, but never both so that an attacker cannot just write exploit code and then execute it afterwards. In Rusty Hermit, the stack and the heap are not executable how it should be, but the code segment is writable. And of course it is executable by design because the code in the code segment has to be executed. And this has the impact that an attacker is now able to exploit arbitrary write vulnerabilities, um, or an attacker who is able to exploit arbitrary write vulnerabilities can now just overwrite kernel code and execute it uh, that way and take control over execution, which is uh, not how it should be. The second uh, requirement was that the attacker knows the target address and the mitigation for this is called ASLR or address space layout randomization. The idea is, hence the name, to randomize the addresses of application, kernel, libraries, and so on, so that the attacker just does not know the memory layout and does not know where to jump to when overwriting the return address. And this was a very quick analysis because ASLR is just not implemented in Rusty Hermit. And yeah, as I said, the impact is that the attacker knows the target address and can um, easily exploit vulnerabilities and does not have to use elaborate techniques to leak memory layout first. The third one is the integrity check thing. And the mitigation here is called stack canaries. The idea is to place a random so-called canary value on the stack between our vulnerable buffer and the return address. Because, as I said, the local buffer, when, it is, uh, when an overflow takes place, this overflow is always linear. So you can only linearly write memory when exploiting a buffer overflow. So the attacker first has to overwrite the canary value in order to reach the return address afterwards. And the program can just check the integrity of the stack canary. And if the stack canary was changed, then the program can detect it was exploited and can just uh, stop execution. And in Rusty Hermit, we have to do a case differentiation. For C applications, the necessary library is not present in the build container, so when following the official build process, it was not possible to use stack canaries. For Rust, this is uh, kind of more complicated because the Rust compiler does not provide stack smashing protection by design. Maybe because they say they are memory safe by design, which is like a little bit of a discussion as we will see later. And the impact here is that an attacker can just uh, yeah, use buffer overflows to overflow and overwrite the return address without leaking the canary value first. 
I said there are three security mitigations, but ASLR and stack canaries heavily rely on randomness. So if our random number generation and handling of these random numbers is flawed, we have a serious impact on overall security. So I decided to analyze uh, random numbers as the fourth uh, thing. And Rusty Hermit provides a pseudo-random number generator, which uses re the recommended constants and is seeded with a time value, which is uh, fine for a pseudo-random number generator, especially at is, as it also provides a true random number generator, which uses the adrand uh, instruction, which is uh, also fine. So besides analyzing these four mentioned security features, I did an in-depth analysis of Rusty Hermit, and I will present you now some notable findings. Of course, I can uh, not present every finding here. First, let's talk about UHive. UHive is a custom hypervisor written for Rusty Hermit. And remember, the idea is to have one application per unikernel to use the hypervisor for isolation, but when the hypervisor provides unchecked access to all files on the host system, then we don't have isolation anymore, right? Um, so yeah, this is a problem. Um, reminder, this is not used in production. It is a research project, um, but it was not documented. And uh, it's, it is something that has a yeah, relevant security impact because if I say in my unikernel, hey, please give me the host system's etc passwd file, then the host system happily gives it to your unikernel, which is uh, not how it should be. The next uh, thing is well, when we are discussing memes, rewrite it in Rust and everything will be memory safe, right? Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, when you, for example, write network drivers, you need Rust unsafe code for um, memory access and for, for direct pointer derivation and so on. And this is code from the network card, uh, from the network driver. And we have our out of bounds read vulnerability here because we, this is the part of the driver which takes the packets coming from the firmware uh, from, from the um, from the network card firmware and handles it in the operating system and we read a length value here and simply trust the length value we read from the packet without checking anything um, we even cut four byte off the length because um, there's a crc checksum at the end of the packet which does not belong to the uh, packet uh, content and so we don't want to want to read it but the problem is, when we here now uh, take a slice from this memory, uh, from this packet in memory, and we just use the length value which was provided to us, and don't check anything, and something gives us a wrong length value, maybe a too long one, then we copy more bytes than our packet uh, length really is. And this is not that dramatic because the packet is coming from the network card, so the network card would have to be compromised in order to um, use this. So this, it doesn't have a real impact, but it should be fixed in an in-depth approach. And it is a good showcase why writing it in Rust doesn't make everything 100% secure. And we can still have memory corruption vulnerabilities here. The next thing is heap hardening. I was sitting in front of the building like two days ago in the evening and we were discussing unikernels and someone was saying, hey, but nobody would write a heap allocation um, by themselves, right? We have libraries for this, why don't just use the library? But when you write your unikernel from scratch and write it in Rust, then you might also write your own heap allocation algorithms. So what happens here is we have a linked list of so-called holds, so we have a free list um, which stores the free memory segments and we have a header at each of these free holds which has a size value and a next value. The size value tells us how large this hole is and the next, uh, the next value just points to the next hole. 
So what an allocator is doing when an application says, hey, I want to, heap, uh, I want to have some, some memory from the heap, then it looks here, is the size value large enough? It, if, it's, if it is not, it follows the next pointer, looks up the next size value, and so on. And so it, the allocator goes through this list. But now consider an application which has a heap buffer overflow vulnerability. What an attacker can now do is overwrite the heap buffer, overflow it, and then overwrite the header of the hole which is placed after the buffer. So an attacker could just overwrite the size value and overwrite it with a larger value or smaller value, which would then produce crashes or um, use after free vulnerabilities. But what an attacker could also do is overwriting the next pointer and letting it point not to the next hole, but to anywhere in the heap and overwrite yeah, whatever the attacker wants to overwrite or let it point to the kernel code or this might be also possible. Um, and remember, the kernel segment is writable in Rusty Hermit. So we might be able to build a nice export chain here. What now happens when the application asks for another heap um, segment now? The allocator goes through this list, sees, OK, this size value is too small, so it follows the next pointer and interprets whatever it points to as a whole. So here the allocator interprets this area as a whole, might see the size value fits because it points to code or whatever is there. This might be relatively large, so the possibility is relatively high that the allocator then gives the address of this back to the application, and the application then um, it can write whatever is here. And if this is user-controlled input, an attacker could yeah, just overwrite arbitrary memory addresses or might be even able to gain code execution this way. Um, a little bit more detailed, it is not 100% correct this is an, that this is an arbitrary write because there are some more restrictions, um, but I didn't discuss them here in detail because uh, of time reasons. Um, what an attacker is now able to do with this yeah, missing heap hardening is to change a linear buffer overflow into uh, arbitrary write vulnerability or even into code execution, which is, of course, uh, very bad. So now let's uh, discuss what I did and what my methods were. were. First, um, I created very simple generic test applications like just pushing a f uh, just writing a function into the stack segment and trying to execute it. This is a very simple test. This is just a few lines of code. And I did a lot of manual reviewing, uh, manually reviewing the code because all projects I reviewed were open source. So I could uh, look into the code of uh, every of those projects. And when I found something, I built a simple proof of concept code showing that this is broken, but I did not do fancy uh, exploit chains or so, because the way from a simple proof of concept showing this is broken to a full working realistic exploit is still a very huge step and costs a lot of time and doesn't have much scientific value because we already showed with the simple proof of concept that it is broken and Remember, this is a master thesis, so it should have some scientific values and not produce fancy exploits, which are nice to demonstrate. And all my code will be published on GitHub in the next day, so you can reproduce my findings. Now, a quick demo where I'll show you how it looks like. Um, on the left side, you should see my Terminal, I will just now uh, run, run this test code and then I'll explain it to you. On the right side, you can see my terminal. And this is all you have to do for Rusty Hermit in order that your application gets compiled into a unikernel. Um, what happens here is we have a hello function which doesn't do much, it just prints out hello world. In our main function, we then print out this function's content, 
which you can see here, it is compiled opcodes of print line hello world. And now we just yeah, print a quick info that we call the function and then we actually call the function. This is what you can see here. Here's our quick info um, that we call the function and here is the hello world output from this function. And the next step, we overwrite the function's content with a lot of Cs and C3. This is just the compiled opcode for in three statements, which we use for padding. And C3 is just a simple return statement. So what we are doing here is overwriting this print line hello world with a simple return. So when now printing our info and execution, executing the function again, um, nothing should happen. And this is what we see here. We successfully over, uh, have overwritten the function, it is now the return statement, and here is our function call info, and you see nothing, so it worked. We were able to overwrite something in Rusty Hermit's code segment and to execute it afterwards, so this proves that the code segment is writable and executable. Now switching back to my slides. Now let's go into the analysis of popular unikernel systems. I analyzed the four explained aspects, ASLR, WX, stack canaries, and random numbers for not only for Rusty Hermit, but also for OSV, Nanos, Unicraft, and MiniOS, as these are the most popular unikernel systems and they are all still maintained. So um, yeah, they are um, already, some of them already fixed things I reported or are working on it. What I find interesting here is that none of the unicorn systems has all the check marks, but Nanos is pretty close and they already fixed a vulnerability I reported to them, which led to the bad rating here. And what I also find interesting is that only one of the unicorn implemented ASLR at all. So I guess this is because it is the um, biggest effort um, of those four security measures to implement ASLR. And this is the reason why only one system implemented it. If you have any questions to one of these uh, unicorns, just uh, ask me after the talk. I can, of course, not uh, present every detail here. But I want to present some notable things because one thing I noted when analyzing unicorns is random number generation seems to be hard. So if you have nothing to do in the evening, just review random software and drink a chunk every time someone does not properly see the random number generator, it will be good for the chunk bar and maybe not that good for your liver. <laughs> um, but yeah, handling ran random numbers um, seems to be hard. So let's start with Unicraft. Unicraft is um, highly configurable, so it uses custom C libraries, for example, lib libukSP for stack smashing protection or libukSV runt for um, random number generation, and you can configure everything. You can configure if you use, want to use static canaries, or if you want to use a zero terminated canary, or if you want to use a random canary, and the same for the random number generation itself. You can um, yeah, configure which random number generator you want to use. You can configure if you want to use a static seed, a time-based seed, a random seed, and so on. So Unicraft provides secure options here. Um, because if you use a random canary, which is um, generated with a random number generator, um, which was properly seeded, this is pretty secure. But the default value is not always the most secure one. And we all know users. Users often just use the default configuration, right? So um, it definitely provides secure configurations here, but they should be the default from my point of view. Now. I think every one of you who did some pen tests knows this. Um, you're saying, hey, I will not spend any more time into finding new issues because I have no time anymore. I have to document my things. And then when copying over the last stack dump into the documentation, you see, oh, this looks weird. And yes, yeah, so it was with 
the Nanos uh, canaries um, because I noticed that they don't look that random. And what I did then is I built a very simple application which just defines a variable on the stack and prints out what is directly behind this variable on the stack. And what directly is lying behind this variable is our stack canary. So this application just prints a stack canary. And then I compiled it into a Nanos unikernel and I run it for 50 times and had a Python script which just collects the canary values and um, sorts them and then does a simple statistics. And yeah, if you see here, this is not that random. Um, 50 times and only f 50 runs and only four different canary values when running this um, as uh, yeah. And but what I want to say here is I disclosed the issue and the proof of concept via email and I did not even give them a full root cause analysis because it was like the evening before I wanted to hand in my master thesis. <laughs> and um, so it was more like a half night shift um, yeah, producing this and um, writing a proof of concept. But they patched it in less than two hours after I reported it, which is really quick. And they also explained the root cause to me via email and said that it was because they ran their random numbers were not properly passed to the application via the AT random vector um, and sent me the um, link to the GitHub uh, patch so um, I can just yeah, reproduce it, that it works now. And they also gave me a public shout out via Twitter, shared our uh, blog post about this. So dear software vendors, this is how you should react when someone reports a vulnerability to you. And this is not very often the case that a company reacts um, so yeah, great when reporting security vulnerabilities to them. <laughs> now let's talk about OSV. OSV uses the have no stack protector flag, which explicitly disables stack canaries in their unikernel. Um, they have a libc shipped with OSV, but they also implemented their own stack check guard, which has a static canary. And remember, the compiler generates the stack checking code, but the operating system is responsible for placing the canary value and um, yeah, that is correct and that is random, it is, that is placed on the correct place so that the compiler uh, generated stack checking code can use this canary. Um, something is broken there when explicitly enabling stack checking protection. So I'm also not sure why they have the F no stack protector flag, but implemented some kind of stack checking code. Um, yeah, anyways, if you enable it, something is broken and the canary, values is always, uh, canary value is always zero. But interestingly, this might make it more secure because some imp input functions stop when reading a null byte. <laughs> and when you have a, a static canary which is, has no null byte, um, then it might be more complicated for an attacker writing a null byte than writing that static canary without a null byte. So being broken might, it, uh, might make it more secure here, which I found uh, also an, an interesting finding. Yeah, MiniOS is part of the Xen project. Um, it is developed for domino disaggregation and it is a starting point for multiple unikernel projects. So, so this is not really used as a unikernel in, in production, but many unikernel projects are based on this and there are some scientific papers um, about unicorns which use this as a starting point for um, implementing something and showing that it works with unicorns. So it was also an interesting target for analysis. And they don't have a real random number generator, but they have some test code um, where they have this. Um, to be fair, they say it should be random enough for our users. <laughs> but <laughs> um, yeah, this, uh, this makes me looking more detailed into it because if they say this should be random enough 
for what they do with it, it doesn't seem to be that random. <laughs> and some users who develop a unicorn might still use this because they see, hey, there's some code how to generate random numbers. I need random numbers. I want to build a unikernel on top of this, so I will use this code. Um, and what the problem here is, we get the time of the day and then take the seconds, which is between 0 and 59, and take the microseconds, which is between 0 and 999, add them, and multiply them with a round mix, which is just a very large constant. But multiplying it with this just spreads the number of possible values to a wider range, but it does not produce more possible values. Um, so after some it iterations, we have a lot of possible random numbers, but especially after the first iteration, we have a very low entropy of possible random numbers here. So this might be yeah, simply brute forced by an attacker. And what you should also note here is we have a if and f have libc here. So if they, there's a libc present, then they don't use their custom rent implementation, but they use the one which is provi provided by libc. And they later call it without, without calling the sRAN function also. And when we look into the Linux menu, then it says that the sRAN function um, sets its argument as the seed for a new sequence of pseudorandom integers to be returned by rand, and this, that this sequence is repeatable by calling sRand with the same seed value. And if no seed value is provided, the rand function is automa automatically seeded with a value of 1. So if you don't call sRand and just call rand without seeding it, then you always get the same reproducible um, random numbers. And this might be, of course, uh, used by an attacker. Um, yeah, to, to get these random numbers. Now I want to discuss some of my findings. First thing is using Rust for unicorns. Um, as we've seen, or as I've explained, memory corruption vulnerabilities can only happen in unsafe code in Rust. This is, uh, there's a paper which proves it that safe Rust is really safe. Um, so that is something we can trust. And it massively, that massively reduces the effort for a code audit. Because with this, I only had to review the unsafe code lines when looking for memory corruption vulnerabilities. And I was able to yeah, review every single line of unsafe code in Rusty Hermit. And when there's a unicorn written in C, I, um, it is yeah, much more time effort to re review every single line of code, because here you only have to review the unsafe code. Um, but we can still have out of bounds, for example, out of bounds read vulnerabilities, as we have seen. So um, this does not solve every problem here, especially as the application might be written in an unsafe language. Remember, for Rusty Hermit, we can still write our application in C. So writing the unikernel in Rust is a great approach, but it, of course, does not solve every problem. Now let's discuss the security claims um, made by unikernels I presented in the beginning of my presentation. The first one is the reduced attack surface due to the minimal operating system. This is, of course, true because, as I said, if there is less code, less code can be exploited. But the application might be arbitrarily complex and have a huge attack surface. And the focus on light whiteness the Unicorn developers have um, seem lead to leaving out security features to be more lightweight or because there's a larger priority on performance than on security, which does not improve security. The second claim is the strong isolation. But as we have seen, the hypervisor might also be vulnerable. And independently, independently from this, the protection, it is a protection against lateral movement, but not against the initial exploit. So if one unikernel is exploited and we have a hypervisor which provides 
proper isolation, then it hinders the attacker from exporting the next unikernel and the next unikernel and so on, uh, or from exporting the host system. But it is no protection against the first unikernel getting exploited. So it is a very good additional protection separating different applications in different unikernels um, isolated by a hypervisor but it is no, not a replacement for the security mitigations like ASLR and so on. Um, the next security claim, or not really security claim, but the next security relevant aspect of unikernels is the single address space. Because of the single address space, there is no escalation of privilege necessary anymore. So if we have pwned a unikernel, we pwned it and we don't need escalating to admin or system or whatever. So the attacker instantly has full control over everything in that unikernel, over the network stack, the hypercall interface, and yeah, can do further things with um, all the capabilities without needing further exploits. And this is especially why these general security features are so important so that a unikernel does not get exploited at all. So what is my conclusion of all of this? First, writing a secure unikernel in terms of it has no vulnerabilities is great, but it is not enough because the kernel developer has no control how insecure the applications are that users write for this unikernel. So even if I have a highly secure unikernel, Someone might write application which is easily exploitable, but in a unikernel, the application and the kernel is the same. It is one thing. So unikernel developers always have to keep the application in mind and provide security features for the application to hinder an attacker from exploiting a vulnerable application. But as I have shown, many security features are not implemented at all or fundamentally flawed for various unicorns. So this is, it. this is it from the presentation side. Thank you everyone for being here, especially thanks to my uh, X41 supervisor Eric for making this possible. And thanks to my university supervisors Stefan and Jonathan. It is not always the case that people are so helpful when analyzing their code for security vulnerabilities. And we um, have uh, yeah, some blog posts about this, so if you want to have more details or want uh, yeah, to see the proof of concepts, just uh, visit our blog posts. I will also publish a blog post next week, which wraps up uh, everything, or you can directly contact me um, under one of those two email addresses. Or we have uh, yeah, a lot of time left over now, so if there are any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Harry. That was uh, actually really interesting, even though I missed half the talk because I was at the door and I had to send at least 20 people away who, who had no room anymore. So uh, that's, that's really interesting. So uh, we still have 15 minutes for questions. Uh, I have two hands at the same time. Just decide who's first. Okay, um, I first have a small remark and then a question. My remark is I I think um, stackneries usually include the zero byte at the beginning anyway. So, okay, not always. Then. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but um, then my question is, uh, you said that Rusty Hermit uh, does not uh, uh, pr uh, set its uh, executable segments to uh, be unwritable. Was this like an oversight or part of its design? And if so, why? Um, just nobody did it <laughs> because um, it is very simple for the stack and the heap because you have just set the flags in the page table, but you can't directly do this for the code segment because first you have to write the code there or map, map the code there and you have to do it afterwards. So it is a little bit, bit more effort and yeah, just nobody did this. Um, but the developers directly said, hey, look at this. Um, and there was already an open issue. So they already know that um, they have to do it, but just nobody did it yet. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah, uh, thank you for the um, also the strong hint that I.O. access is still a bit of an issue with the unsafety. Um, and my question would be, because I'm very much interested in resource access controls, um, how do you feel about approaches like the Theseus project, or have you even looked into that, which wants to push that uh, responsibility to the compiler? Which project? Sorry. Theseus, like the Theseus, the ship. I think from I hear the I name, seen but it. No, never mind. I didn't look in, but we can um, talk about it afterwards. Yeah, let's meet. Sounds later. interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, you showed some bad random number generation. What are your criteria for good random number generation other than seeding? Um, best thing is to use a hardware random number generator, of course, or use the RD run instruction. Um, some yes, CPUs provide um, access to it, and you can also pass the values through Q QEMO, for example, and it is always uh, the best. To, to use um, hardware random numbers. But if you need a very fast um, random number generator, you can also use a pseudo random number genera generator, but then you have to properly seed it. Best thing is to, to seed it with a true random number from a hardware random number generator. And then if you have a yeah, proper algorithm um, for true random number, uh, for pseudo random number generation, this is also fine. Um, for example, cha cha or salsa are some algorithms used for this. Okay, thanks. Well, um, you, s you told us that there were many unikernels which did not have any or not all of the memory um, defense mechanisms implemented like ASLR and stuff. Um, can you tell what exactly is the reason for that? Is it because of performance reasons? Is it because of laziness or uh, is it just on the to-do list of the whatever? and? Yeah, why exactly didn't they implement it? Um, I mean, many of those, or all of those projects are open source projects. So, um, you know, often or sometimes by a single developer and then he has just too many open tasks. For example, for, for MiniOS, I um, wrote an email to the main developer and asked, so, hey, you have um, none of those mechanisms properly implemented um, other than uh, WX policy. And um, he said, yeah, Patch is always welcome, so a classical um, open source project answer. Um, other things have more priority. Um, and yeah, but for example, um, the U one of the Unicraft uh, guys tweeted to me, I think yesterday in the evening, um, yeah, we are working on it and uh, now we uh, fixed this. So um, I think yeah, often just the people did not do it yet or it doesn't have a high priority. Um, but my problem with this is that many unicorns claim to be more secure, or in a lot of unicorn papers you can read, yeah, this is secure, but yeah, often it is not. And everyone says, yeah, okay, there's a, just a very, very small piece of code, so this is not exploitable, but they seem to oversee that the application might be um, exploitable. So um, I think, or I hope that my master thesis motivates the people to see the problem and to implement um, those security features and to yeah, put it higher on their priority list. This is, I think it's a priority problem mainly. mainly. Okay, so yeah. it's not on purpose though. That was a question. Thanks. <laughs> so thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering about the last part you made with um, that everything is in the same address space. Um, and that we don't need any privilege escalation. Um, couldn't we, or like, is it the best idea to have everything or like the privilege separation in the unikernel or couldn't we that, uh, push that to the hypervisor? That like the, the complete, um, I don't know, VM <laughs> uh, just has uh, the privileges that are really necessary for the application because then we don't really have uh, this problem, I guess. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, but as I said, isolation by the hypervisor is only an ad additional thing. Um, and you, if you exploit the unikernel, you also have access to the network stack, if it has a network stack. So um, you can use this then, for example, to craft um, raw network packets and trying to exploit something over the network and so on. Um, and if you would have a separation, more separation inside the unikernel, 
um, then you would not directly have access to everything which you can th could then use to exploit further systems. Um, but um, to, to answer your question, um, it does not make sense to make this separation inside the unikernel because this is of a concept of unicorns to not have this separation. But then you have to implement all the other security features um, in order to, to stop uh, exploitation. Thank you. Any, oops. Any more questions? We still have uh, 10 minutes. Ah, yeah, all right. Right, so, um, yeah, again, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, my question would be, um, I mean, assume that these other unicorns you mentioned are actually like used in production environments. And my question would be, do you know of any cases where these vulnerabilities were actually exploited in like production environments? Um, as I know, most of the unicorns are not used in production. I'm not sure the only one way I know that they are used in production is Nanos. Um, there you can um, yeah, um, buy VMs running on, on these unikernels, and I don't know of, of any successful exploits there. Okay. Yeah, since we still have a few minutes, um, could you maybe sketch a bit how like an, uh, a typical deployment would work with one of these unicorns. Like I can imagine you run like a bare metal hypervisor and then how does the hypervisor actually get the unicorn to run and how would it execute it and so on. Uh, that was a bit missing uh, for, to get a full understanding for me of that model. Um, yeah, um, we can maybe go back. Um, um, here, so, um, yeah, it, it, um, directly, um, runs on the hypervisor as a normal operating, virtual operating system, um, would do. Um, for example, when I switch to the demo, then you can see that this is just here it is just run on top of QEMO. So um it's a simple simple running on, on QEMO here um with this uh configuration. And when you switch to the code here you just have to import this ah, for for Rusty Hermit, you just have to import this crate, for example, and then it gets compiled into an image, like you would run a virtual machine image on um, QEMO or whatever your hypervisor is. Um, and as a user, you don't have to do much there. Just compile it um, with the tools provided by by the unikernels, and um, yeah, then then a, you you get a runnable image, which you then can run on top of QEMO. Oh. So you still have another system around which is it's actually providing the hypervisor. What do you mean with providing Cy the hypervisor? Cy oh, yeah, th this this one is um, running in my um, on on my laptop with Coemo, mm -hmm. um, but for example, um, MiniOS can directly run on Xen, um, so um, you have a DOM zero there which which controls the um, unicorns running, but they are very different concepts. For example, Rusty Hermit uh, can also run bare metal. Um, so it is, is, is different for, for a lot of unicorns. And there's also um, Hermit Core, which is um, which were before Rusty Hermit, which could um, yeah, run in parallel. So um, there are, for example, two cores um, given to the unicorn, and then the unicorn can run in parallel to your Linux. So there's a very wide range of, of concepts. Um, how to, to run these unicorns on top of uh, the different platforms. Yeah, that, that's also a bit how I understood it, but I wasn't really sure in, you know, like comparing everything in, in one system as in the one physical machine eventually was a bit hard conceptually. Yeah. Thank you. 
All right. If there are no more questions, then uh, I say once again thank you and a final round of applause for this cool talk. Thank you.